I'm Dr. Kelly Ferraro, um, and today I will be discussing pulmonary function tests with a focus on what internists need to know. I have an internal medicine background. Um, my husband is a pulmonologist, and so it's it, always interesting to me to see what we use versus what uh, he uses. Um, specifically, I'm going to focus a lot on spirometry and how we interpret those results to help us take good care of our patients. So a little bit about me, I am an internist. I uh, went to Emory Medical School and have spent the past 11 years out here in San Antonio, first as a military physician, and then as a civilian physician working at the same facility, Brook Army Medical Center or San Antonio Military Medical Center. This past year, I went back to do a hospice and palliative fellowship at UT Health San Antonio, which I'm really enjoying. And we are excited to be moving to Denver, Colorado this summer. I have no disclosures. Okay, so my one bad joke for today, we're talking about pulmonary function tests. So everyone, let's take a deep breath as we get started. ba bum ching right? Today, we'll uh, make sure that we can state why pulmonary function tests can be ordered or should be ordered. We will be able to interpret spirometry and obstructive and restrictive lung disease, and then give a differential diagnosis depending on flow volume loops. And I've divided this into four parts. I think this is a little shorter than my um, chest pain lecture. So I know it's a Friday afternoon there in Cameroon. Hopefully we'll get you guys out for the weekend uh, or back to work as likely as the residents. Uh, we'll be talking about a big picture evaluation of pulmonary function tests. We'll talk about spirometry and obstructive lung disease, flow volume loops, and then restrictive lung disease. So thinking about the patient, we always start with the patient, right? Why would you order pulmonary function tests for your patient? Really, I want us to start thinking about a clinical picture. We may be thinking about a patient with a chronic cough or shortness of breath. Um, maybe that you're seeing on other testing, maybe the patient had chest pain, you got a chest x-ray and you're seeing expanded lungs or blebs. Um, maybe an ABG shows you that the patient's hypercapnic and you're trying to figure out why. So you're trying to determine the cause of breathing problems. You're trying to diagnose or grade the severity of lung diseases. You may be evaluating lung function before surgery. This is recommended um, in patients to determine risk for things like prolonged intubation, uh, post-operative pneumonia or atelectasis, difficulty with breathing around surgery. And we generally recommend spirometry. Uh, before surgery in patients who are over 70, have morbid obesity, they're getting thoracic or abdominal surgery, um, or if they have known lung disease. That shouldn't necessarily delay the surgery. You're still looking at risk benefit there. Uh, but if the surgery is optional or could be delayed and your pulmonary function test or spirometry doesn't look very good, you may end up saying, hey, maybe we should wait to get the surgery. Let's optimize the patient based on get them to stop smoking, get them to um, use inhalers, see if you can get their lung function better to minimize their risk from the surgery. You may be using spirometry or pulmonary function tests to monitor lung dysfunction during ongoing exposures, uh, medications, or environmental, and you can be monitoring for response to treatment. Again here, um, so what are pulmonary function tests? As an internist, I usually think about spirometry. Realize that pulmonary function tests can encapsulate anything from an arterial blood gas, simple spirometry, a six minute walk, um, uh, carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide diffusing uh, capacity. So here, when I talk about pulmonary function tests, I'm usually gonna be talking about spirometry and a little bit about lung volumes, just because that's what we use most as internists. When I think about spirometry, I oftentimes am asking the patient, did you get spirometry? And a lot of times they don't know what that means. I'll say, did they test your lungs? And a lot of them see the doctor so often that they can't remember if they had this. Um, have, do you guys do spirometry? Like, are, are you actually involved? Are you, um, have you seen this done? Can you show hands if you have? Not much, a little bit. It was not something I was really involved with as a medicine resident, um, but I, I have gone to see it get done. I think it's worth seeing it at least once um, just to know what your patients go through. The key for this is if you look, this woman's doing the spirometry, so she has a nose clip on, she's breathing into the tube, sitting in a chair. 
this is the tech and the way I always ask the patients that they do remember is I'll say, did someone yell at you at some point, blow, 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 blow. And if they can remember that, then um, they, they had spirometry because it's really dependent on the tech coaching here. So who shouldn't get spirometry? In general, this is a very safe test, but we wanna think again, it's usually not an emergent test. So if a patient has hemoptysis of unknown origin, they have a pneumothorax, if they have abdominal or if they have recent abdominal or thoracic surgeries, uh, eye surgery or different aneurysms. Like I'm muted. There we go. Okay. Unmuted, we're set. Can you guys hear me? Good? Okay. Um, sorry, it's coming up on my screen that I'm muted. So if you have recent eye surgery, um, aneurysms or thoracic or abdominal surgery, you want to think about the fact that these patients, as they blow, 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 are, giving, are getting a lot of pressure. And that can cause problems with um, bursting the aneurysm, problems with intra, um, uh, intraocular pressures, or you know, at the incision lines in these thoracic or abdominal surgeries. Your only absolute contraindication, actually, to spirometry is a heart attack within the last 30 days. Um, but again, if a patient isn't going to be able to do well on this test, we'll talk about quality control and making sure that they're able, you know, that they're actually giving good effort. So if they're vertiginous, if they're vomiting, this is a time to stop and step back and say, maybe now's not the time to get the test. So let's look at what we're measuring. We have four volumes and four capacities, right? And um, the capacities are just sums of two or more volumes. As we sit and just breathe in and out, we are, um, we are normally breathing our tidal volume. So that's from a normal exhalation to a normal inhalation. And that's our, quiet, our normal quiet breathing. It's usually about seven uh, cc's a kilo. It's about 500 cc's per, per person. Um, so that's in and out, in and out. And then we have from our top of our normal breaths as our quiet breathing to a forced inhalation, that is our inspiratory reserve volume. And that is about two or three liters. From the bottom, oh, so as we um, combine those two, that's our inspiratory capacity. So from the bottom of your normal breathing, a normal breath out to the biggest breath in that you can take, that's your inspiratory capacity. From our normal breathing, our normal tidal volume, our normal quiet exhalation to a forced exhalation, that's our expiratory reserve volume. That's normally 700 to about 1,000 milliliters. And then the amount of air left in our lungs after that forced exhalation is our reserve volume. And our functional residual capacity, which is our expiratory reserve volume minus our reserve, uh, plus our residual volume, is gonna be the amount of air left in our lungs at the end of a tidal volume respiration. That is dependent on your elastic force of your chest versus the uh, balanced by the elastic force of the lungs. So as a patient's going forward to take spirometry, they're breathing normally, then they're going to take the biggest breath in that they can, and then the biggest breath out that they can. And that is their vital capacity. So from the top of the biggest breath in to the farthest breath out, that's your volume of air, your vital capacity. A forced vital capacity is when you do this forcefully, as hard or as fast as you can. That's normally what we're measuring in spirometry. It's important to note that sometimes they actually measure a slow vital capacity. Force vital capacity we're gonna look at is very useful in looking at obstruction and detecting obstruction is very sensitive for that. But if a patient is obstructive and you're trying to determine their lung volumes, it may be helpful to see, can they blow it out slowly, kind of avoiding triggering that obstruction as much and get more of the air out. Um, then your total lung capacity is from the top of your respiratory um, capacity down to the, all of the air in your lungs, normally about six liters. So what are you looking for with spirometry? Um, you're gonna be looking for a force vital capacity time of about six seconds. You're gonna be looking for good flow volume loops with good effort, no cough. You're gonna be looking for it to be reproducible. And a normal range varies about 20% in either direction from, from the predicted values for FEV1 and FVC. How do they get to predicted values? They look at age, gender, 
um, height and weight and ethnicity, right? And so they've looked at population studies for what is normal. And it's important as actually as you do your quality control to make sure that the right gender is put in there. If the wrong gender, the wrong age, um, the wrong height and weight are inputted, then you're gonna be comparing your patient to somebody who is not their, in their average demographic, right? So a little old lady should not have the same values as a young 20 something year old man. Um, and so it's important to just make sure as you quality control through that the right patient demographics are actually put in. What other problems can you see on flow volume loops? So this is why you're getting multiple tests, normally two or three, making sure that they track along each other. You might see that they have difficulty with a slow start of their forced exfoliation. They may not have much effort to it. Uh, it's very effort dependent test. They may cough, um, particularly if we're getting this for someone with a chronic cough or different lung disease issues. They may have an incomplete inhalation, so they may not completely take that big breath in beforehand. Um, they may stop their exhalation before the, before the end, and they may not get to the closure of the loop. So this is looking um, at a chart here for what their force vital capacity is. We're looking at their volume versus their time in seconds. Again, we're looking for normal is six seconds of exhalation at least. So this patient takes a breath in and then forcefully exhales at least six seconds. Um, normal is about 75 to 80% of the force vital capacity comes within the first second, right? And that's your FEV1. And you also see this plateau out at around three seconds. You shouldn't see that the curve continues to go up dramatically here. I think it's always useful to compare next to each other what normal and then our two most common patterns are. So, a normal pattern, we see a steep expiratory curve and then a decreased flow rate due to dynamic airway compression. So they're working hard. And then as the air volume decreases dramatically, they're just not going to be able to put out that much. With restriction, we see it's kind of a similar curve, but it's just much lower volumes. And then with obstruction, we start at a higher volume. Um, and we see a decreased flow rate and a decreased FEV1. We're going to go into these in more detail. And I like simple ways to remember things. So I think about the changes with disease. So and this will become clear in a minute, but think about obstruction like a milkshake and then restriction is the guy sitting on your chest, right? Okay, so if there's one slide to take away from this whole presentation, it's this one you're gonna have a methodical approach to this. FEV1 over FVC, when it's low, um, you're gonna be looking at FVC, and then if that's normal or high, so if they're proportionally reduced, we're gonna be thinking about obstructive lung disease. You're gonna look at FEV1 over FVC, if these are potentially proportionally reduced or both normal, um, then they'll be normal or high. You're thinking about FVC, if that's low, so they're both proportionally reduced, you're gonna be thinking about restrictive lung disease. If all of this is normal, you're thinking about normal spirometry. If FE1 over FBC is low, FBC is also low, you're thinking about a mixed pattern. Okay, so now we know what normal looks like and how to detect problems, so let's focus in on obstruction. So going back to this slide and really zooming in there, again, obstruction is a limited um, expiratory flow. So you're going to think about FEV1 over FBC uh, being low, FBC being normal or high, and that would be obstruction pattern. So obstruction is defined by an FEV1 over FBC less than 70%. Um, we see an increased or normal total lung capacity, but this is the scooping out here in the flow, and that's where we see the reduced values. What do we see in terms of lung volumes? We see usually a decrease in our inspiratory reserve volume because we're just getting to the max of what our chest can hold, and we see an increased residual volume. So an increased total lung capacity often happens um, in a, in a, or can happen in obstructive lung disease. 
how do we grade obstructive lung disease? For severity, we think about FEV1 um, at the percent predicted. Mentally, I always think 80, 50, 30 in my head for this. So greater than 80%, if the FEV1 per percent predicted is greater than 80%, the severity is mild. 50 to 80 is moderate. 30 to 50 is severe. And less than 30 is very severe. This is the gold, the gold guidelines for COPD. And then what's our differential for seeing this in a patient? We're thinking about asthma, COPD, emphysema, um, bronchitis. We're thinking about local obstruction, so things like focal cord dysfunction, tracheal stenosis. And then we're thinking about things like cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, alpha-1 antitrypsin disorder, uh, different masses. When we see obstruction, we also want to ask ourselves, is there a bronchodilator response? So is there reversibility of airway obstruction? The FEV1 in this would increase by 12% of predicted or 200% increase in the FBC. And so we can see that this is a line, this is an example, this is the, um, the flow loop before the bronchodilator, and this is after the bronchodilator. It increases by um, greater than 200 cc's, greater than 12%, and we can say that that's a, um, that's a positive response, punk, positive bronchodilator response. So let's look at real spirometry and see how we would do this with a patient. Okay. So when I first look at this, again, I'm going to quality control. I'm going to look and make sure that their height, their weight, their race, all of that is, this, is correct um, because that can really affect your percent predicted values. And then I'm going to zoom in down on the bottom graphs. I'm going to zoom in on um, their, their volume loop here. So this is their normal. They take their inspiration and then they're blowing out. So did they go six seconds? So it's from about one and a half to about seven and a half, eight seconds. So yes, that's more than six seconds. They have a good long exhalation. Um, you look at this, you say normally this should actually be a little bit steeper of a curve, right? So that's starting to probably suggest some obstruction to you. And then we look at their flow volume loops. And we can see here, so this is their normal tidal volume, okay? as they're just breathing normally. This is when they take a big deep breath in, and then they take a big exhalation. Um, when we look at this, we can see that their flow rate's low, so this should be higher, okay? It should hit five or six um, liters per minute. And we see that this scooping out. So we're already visually starting to see some cues that there's probably obstructive lung disease here. Going forward, so when we look, this is the reference value. It's important to realize that the reference value is going to be, again, based on those um, mat like matched normals. And the second column, column here is going to be your uh, measured values and then your percentage of your predicted. So we look at FEV1 over FBC. We see that 46, which is less than 70. Um, uh, is this patient's result, and we say that this is obstruction. Okay, so FEV1 over FVC less than 70. We then want to look and see how severe the obstruction is. So we say, what's their FEV1? Well, their percent predicted, this is less than 30, and so that's very severe. And we ask ourselves, is there reversibility? So the FEV1 increases by greater than 12%. Uh, I think it's interesting to note here that their lung volumes are actually uh, low enough that it doesn't increase by, uh, oh, it does increase, sorry, it does increase by 200 ml of FVC, but still the um, FV1 or FVC, you know, 17%, not a, not a huge improvement, still meets criteria, um, could be somewhere on the spectrum of asthma versus potentially COPD with some reversibility. Note that the FBC is also low here, right? And so this could suggest a concomitant restrictive pattern. We're, we were again saying that all the volume loops looked a little small. And so we should get a total lung capacity to confirm this. Okay, moving to part three. 
So this is a, a classic patient presentation for us. Um, and particularly, it's a highly testable patient presentation for us. So a 30-year-old woman is evaluated for repeated episodes of acute shortness of breath. These episodes are associated with vocal changes, difficulty breathing, and chest tightness. The symptoms start and stop very suddenly. They come on, um, and then they're gone. And treatment, she goes to the ER, she's treated um, with a nebulizer, beta agonist, and doesn't feel much better. Physical examination, her vitals are normal, she looks anxious, her lungs are clear, and spirometry is essentially normal. So what is the next diagnostic step? So would you get a CT scan of her neck? Would you look at flow volume loops, a chest x-ray, or would you refer her to a psychiatrist for anxiety? Um, so for this patient, this is a, a classic presentation of vocal cord dysfunction. We wanna look at flow volume loops. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna invite you to think about a, um, a milkshake. So as we go through, we think about, I'm sorry, this pulled something down here. Oops. Okay. Um, we think about a fixed upper airway obstruction, and this we can see flattening on both the expiratory and the inspiratory loop. So fixed obstruction has flattening on both sides. That can be caused by strictures, fibrosis, problems in the main bronchi. Okay. When we think about an intrapulmonary obstruction, so that's something down in the lower airway, something like emphysema, COPD that we've been looking about, we're thinking about these classic flow volume loops we've just been talking about. Then when we think about variable obstructions, uh, this, is, this is a key to differentiate. So a variable intrathoracic obstruction, so if it's in your thorax, something like tracheomalacia, polychondritis, that is going to have an uh, expiratory loop that's flattened and a normal inspiratory loop. With something like vocal cord dysfunction, goiter, neoplasm, or airway burns, something that's extrathoracic, that's a variable extrathoracic obstruction, and you're going to have flattening of your inspiratory loop. So one way I was taught to remember this is I to E, they're the opposite, so it's an extrathoracic obstruction causing inspiratory flattening, intrathoracic obstruction causing expiratory flattening. The other way that I really like that I was taught with this is that a variable extrathoracic obstruction is a milkshake, okay? So you can take a milkshake away or put it up, but if you're drinking through a straw, think about what happens when you drink with a milkshake. You've got that thick milkshake on the other end, and as you drink in, the straw actually collapses, okay? That is a variable extrathoracic obstruction, and that's what's happening to your airway. As you inhale, you're seeing it collapse, and it's flattening out. If you try and blow bubbles into a milkshake, though, and maybe you're thinking back to childhood, it's been a while, right? Um, I've actually done this in adulthood because I learned this in adulthood, but you, you can actually blow bubbles out, so your expiratory loop remains normal. Um, and that's one, one way to think about the physiology, which, I don't know, made sense to me in the real world, took it out of the lungs and put it into uh, ice cream, which I can always relate to. So hopefully that helps you guys. Okay, so our last part. We've looked at obstruction, um, both with classic obstruction and then uh, the flow volume loops for variable, extrathoracic and intrathoracic obstruction. Let's look at restriction, love, love, excuse me, restricted lung disease. Again, with this pathway, we're thinking about an FEV1 over FVC being normal or high, and then an FVC being low. So what does that mean? Ultimately, if you can get to this pathway, that means that your FEV1 over FVC are proportionally decreased, and you're going to have restricted lung disease. Um, it's important to realize that without with just spirometry, you can only call this a restrictive pattern. So to be complete, we need to call it, uh, you need lung volumes. And again, where are these patients falling? They're falling onto the lower lung volume side, a similar curve, just less air moving overall. So all of our volumes are decreased. And when I think about restricted lung volumes, I think about um, what can be causing it. I like to think about someone sitting outside of your chest. But different causes, acute viral causes, flu, uh, varicella, CMV, atypical bacterial infections, 
drug reactions like methotrexate, nitrofurantoin, and amiodarone. These are things that we monitor for when patients are chronically on these medicines. <coughs> um, chronic conditions, so problems like obesity or pregnancy. I've been pregnant twice, and both times I can tell you that you definitely have problems breathing in at the end. Thoracic or chest wall issues with scoliosis, kyphosis, ankylosing spondylitis, different pleural disorders, interstitial lung disease, and then neurologic disorders, so things like ALS, Guillain-Barre, and myasthenia. Again, let's look at some real-world um, test results. So we are going to zoom in on the bottom here again. So again, low lung volumes, a little bit of a steeper curve up this time. It does plateau, and they are able to breathe out for greater than six seconds. When I look at the uh, flow volume loops, I'm saying, wow, these are very small lung volumes, right? It starts out low and it stays low and small. But I can also tell that this is good data. There's no cough, that the multiple loops mimic each other, are very close. Um, and so they're reproducible results, which means the patient was doing their best. Okay, so when we look at a restrictive pattern, again, we're gonna look at an FEV1 over FVC. So this is 82%, so it's normal. And then we're gonna look at an FVC that's low, less than 70%. And so they're able to get the amount, the air out, okay? There's, no, there's not obstruction there, but there's a smaller amount of air overall. It's proportionately decreased both the FEV1 and the FVC. Knowing this, we, we order lung volumes, and we can see that their total lung capacity and their vital capacity are both reduced. This could be due to um, lung parenchymal changes, disease of the pleura, again, chest wall, neuromuscular disorders. We really need to be thinking about why here. There's a really wide range of diseases. Okay, so in summary, um, I hope that you'll start with the clinical picture. Remember that pulmonary function tests are useful. They're likely underutilized. The gold guidelines recommend spirometry in patients with um, gosh, almost anything, a chronic cough, dyspnea, any, any pulmonary complaint, smokers, just because it's a low risk, um, low cost, uh, potentially high yield test. Always remember to quality control the data. Remember that obstructive lung disease, FEV1 over FVC less than 70%. And a milkshake is a great example of a variable extrathoracic obstruction. Again, I hope you'll remember um, this slide. FEV1 over FVC, if it's low, you're thinking about the FVC being normal or high obstructive pattern, and then getting down to the restrictive pattern with a normal or high FEV1 over FVC, uh, looking at their low FVC, thinking about a restrictive pattern, and then getting lung volumes to think about restrictive lung disease. Thanks everyone for your attention. I hope this was helpful.